Uh, well, welcome back, spew tubers. Uh, been a few days since I did this. <coughs> started this book of my dad's. Um, I thought I'd get back to it. This is it's hard to do. It's a lot of work. Uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, it's emotionally difficult. It's reminding me. So anyway, <coughs> let's go back to get pay page eight. Payday was always on a Friday, <coughs> and the army <coughs> always paid its men on payday in alphabetical order. So if you're lucky enough to have a surname like Alan Abbey, <coughs> you would of course get your name called early in the piece, as it were, and get to pay, get get off pay parade very quickly. By the same token, if your surname was at the end of the alphabet, you had to stand and wait. I had from the first week left an allowance of five shillings a week to my mother in the form of an allotment. Uh, and she collected that money up to the last day of my discharge from the army. The payday. We formed up in our squad on the main parade ground in front of the long wooden table. Seated on one side was the paying out officer and his pay clerk. The clerk would start to call out the names of the men in alphabetical order as mentioned and the drill was as follows in my case the clerk would call manly I would come to attention take two paces forward in the front rank or two paces backwards if in the rear rank march up to the table turn face the paying out officer in a loud and clear voice give out the old routine eight four seven six 916 driver manly g sir everything backwards everything backwards in the army that's not surprising really it's a bit like government mm. then salute the paying out officer hold out my right hand take pay transfer pay to left hand salute again about turn and march off heaven help any driver who made a mistake in the ritual or not shouting loud enough to satisfy our instructor or forgetting his army number or forgetting to salute but the crime of crimes forgetting to say sir at the end of a piece I can assure you that in our early days of training every one of us made some mistake or other on payday and the punishment for these terrible mistakes was to have to run up and down the iron stairway at the end of the parade ground or led up to the barrack rooms oh, cool. Yeah, modern army, why not? These barrack rooms ran the whole length of the parade ground and were three flights high. So, yeah, I'm being attacked by a bird who's probably going to turn my f camera off again if I'm not careful. What? The idea was that the criminal, what do you want, you big sook? Huh? Huh? <laughs> ran up the ant criminal in, in, in um, yeah, ant, ant. criminal, ran up the end stairway up the three flights of stairs, ran the whole length of the barrack rooms and down the end stairway to the parade ground and off again at full speed until the sergeant instructor decided that the culprit had had enough. I had to do it on more than one occasion and wearing the very heavy boots. By the time I was given the order to stop, I was really buggered. <laughs> My old man. The food at the depot was very good, wholesome and plenty of it. Everything, no, nothing fancy, but very filling. It was. It's surprising after a few weeks of army life how hungry we all were at meal times, and how we all looked forward to going to the dining room. At meal times we would parade at the bottom of our barrack room, which incidentally was one floor up, in two lines. Pardon me. In the ranks, standing at ease, pint mug in left hand and behind back, pint mug army issue. And when we marched off to the dining room, left arm remained back. Behind back, right arm swinging shoulder high, then we paraded before moving off to the dining room over. Yeah. We were inspected by the bombardier instructor and I have known him to break one of the men's mugs with his cane because he said that it was dirty and not fit to drink out of. When the unlucky driver went to the quartermaster's store to get a new mug, not only have to pay for it, <laughs> pay for it, yeah, of course, because, you know, the government can't afford it. But also, for the one the bombardier had broken. Right. There was not a thing done, one could do about it. You had no recourse, in other words, I suppose. <laughs> Good old British Army. 
Uh, interesting place. I nearly finished up in the Australian Air Force, but my eyes weren't good enough. Not back then. To complain would only land you in a lot of trouble with the capital T. Discipline was getting a good hold on us all. We used to call the two instructors for everything we lay our tongues to, but never to their face. Of course not. My evenings, whenever time permitted, were spent in a very large and well fitted out canteen in the front where we could play billiards or snooker, table tennis or just sit around talking. And my old man was a good bloody snooker player, I tell you. So was I, but he was really good around talking or writing letters home. And especially at the house, a large slice of solid fruit cake, referred to as a door stopper, could be bought for the magnificent price of one penny. And the fruit slice was a meal in itself. Yeah, I believe that. Uh, Jesus, I wouldn't mind one of them. I love fruit slices. The canteen, no, I wonder where I get that from. Fruit slices, I wonder. Uh, it wouldn't be my dad, would it? The canteen also... Also <laughs> held a bar of... Uh-uh, no. Eight years shit features. Stealing me glasses. Freaking bird stealing me glasses. Brand new glasses. Now just shit on me because of that. Where was I? Oh, yeah, the door stopper. The canteen also sold a bar of very hard chocolate known as a bar of Duncan's. And I think that it also cost a penny. It was a large block and as stated, very hard to break. <laughs> Here you go, you want to go up there? Go on. Go on, I'll open the window for you. My bird wants to go outside and freeze his balls off. It was a large block and they stayed very hard to break. An ex expression used by the army, Waco, or Waco, if one asks, one asked where a certain article uh, produced after being found the person finding same um, would promptly say that the hell do you think this is a bar of Duncan's? Oh. Why this expression was used, I do not know. There's something, yeah. British Army expressions. There was also a small canteen, the top of a flight of stairs. You be good bird, don't you jump? Well, right, good. No, flight of stairs, he jumps off the window so he hurts himself. So, he can't fly. Opposite one of the guard rooms, I think it was the one at the east gate, and it sold hot meals like fish and chips. They could also be bought for a penny. There was an old piano in this canteen, and it was there that I had my first go at playing a piano. Yeah, it wasn't his last, I tell you. I used to spend quite a lot of my spare time up in this canteen and sitting at the piano, picking tunes on it, and passing many a pleasant hour away from the very hard life I was having at the depot. They were issued with riding breeches, putties, and spurs. The leather grip on the inside of the riding breeches had to be blank. Just checking the camera's still going. Yeah. Had to be blank o grain and were the and were the tapes on the putties. The tapes were used to tie on the putties after they were wrapped very carefully around the legs starting just below the knee. In a spat in a set pattern and down to the top. Yeah, we're up to page eleven, weren't we? Uh, pardon the the glasses have been hanging. Uh, I don't wear bifocals because bifocals are not good when you're playing golf, and I play golf. Uh, not as much as I'd like to, but I still get golf balls. But yeah, bifocals and golf, yeah, don't mix. So I'm stuck with doing this, uh, and if I don't hang the glasses here, the bird gets them. So page 11. Uh, Grooming of the horses. This is where my horse Quicksilver came into his own. I learned very quickly that as long as I kept him in the middle of his loose box or stall, I was okay. But let him get near me, <laughs> wall or rail, he would pin me against it, all his weight, and me being so small and light, I found that I could not move. The first time this happened to me, I was real frightened, so I shout for help. At the top of my voice, the sergeant who was in charge of us came into the stall and started to laugh and said, 
I see that he has caught you, hasn't he? <laughs> Obviously, he had met this problem before. He told me to give the horse a belt under the tummy with curry comb that I had in my left hand. So I opened the comb, and it was surprising just how quick it moved away. The curry comb mentioned for the benefit of non-horsey types was used in the grooming of the horse, and it was used with a with a brush that I had on my other hand. The comb was a square of metal with a strap across the back that fitted over the left hand and the face was covered with sharp teeth. The reason that the horse moved very quickly when I hit him under the tummy with, his, with the curry comb. Yeah, sounds like torture to me, but yeah, this is, this is old school. Talk to my daughter, Candace, Candace Manley, his granddaughter, and he, she will frown. She doesn't do anything like this to her horse and I don't blame her. The brush also had a strap across the back to fit over the right hand and after rubbing the brush over the horse I then dragged the brush and the teeth and the curry comb this cleaning, thus cleaning the brush. Savvy? Mind you, Quicksilver never gave up trying to pin me against the wall or the whale. I believe that. Horses are a bit like that. Well, what with horse riding, marching drill, rifle drilling. Oh yes, we had to do marching and rifle drill because we had to do guard duty to the gates of the barracks. Fatigues, physical training or better known as PDS another form of torture, only this was carried out in the gymnasium and under a PT instructor by the name and rank of Bombardier Willie Woodbine. <laughs> Willie Woodbine, Woodbine's a cigarette. My mother used to smoke Woodbine's. <laughs> Who was as fit and healthy with a physique like Adonis. And every time, everything that he did in the gym as part of our training, he made look so easy. <laughs> but what I, I, that's the bird is, is jingling, the bird's jingling, I don't know if you can hear it, but when I tried it, I always fell flat on my face, but after a time I managed to get through it, but PTS, were never my strong point. Getting back to the yarn, with all, don't forget my dad was only um, 16 at this stage, with all this work, the days seemed to pass very quickly. I, I still hadn't, what was I at 16, I still had two inches to grow at 16, yeah maybe more. The spit and polish was still plentiful but things were getting a lot easier. I was settling into army life quite well and as the weeks went by I got to know the other men in the squad and I found most of them easy to get along with and also the sergeant and the bombardier were getting to know us a lot better and things were becoming quite bearable. <laughs> quite bearable. <laughs> nice. Our squad was not the last one on parade as others had had formed up behind us and we were all starting to feel quite cocky and feeling very sorry for the new lads just starting out on their training. What's this? How, how far are we into it? It doesn't really say. Then came the day when we were issued with our full regimental uniform. The real thing. Peaked cap, jacket with brass buttons and letters, R and A, the brass to put it in our epaulets on our shoulders but we were not given our collar badges as they would only be issued to us after we had passed out at the end of our training and ready to leave the depot for a posting to a regular unit. I mentioned way back in the story that on joining the army I'd left an allotment to my mother of five shillings a week. Correction, it was five shillings and sixpence a week. What made me remember that, I do not know, but I thought I had better mention it while I was thinking of it. Okay, good on my dad. This will this will be uh, part of the book, I'd say. It, apparently, it, it he remembers stuff and puts it in. So, yeah, it is what it is. The paymaster always took extra money out of our pay so that we would have more money to take home when we went home on leave at the end of our training. Mum told oh, that's why the brothers had extra money when they were at home on leave because the paymaster hid it from them without telling. <laughs> nice guys, that's pretty cool. I got to admit, that's very cool. That's looking out for the young guys. Yeah. Mum told me on my return home in 1946 how useful she had found the money, especially during the war. Back at the depot and the uniform issue, when dressed in my full uniform for guard mounting, I felt great. And for the first time, I felt that I was at last in the army proper. The RA uniform in those days was a very smart one indeed. Something I forgot to mention early on in the story 
and that was in regarding to shaving. I, like everyone else, had been issued with a razor and a shaving brush. As I was only 16 years of age, I did not have to shave, as I did not think it necessary. But on my first day on parade on the depot, the sergeant asked me if I had shaved that morning. And in all innocence, I replied, no sergeant. And he informed me in no uncertain manner that as I had been issued with a razor and a brush to bloody well use them. And as I was so frightened <laughs> of what had happened to me if I did not shave from that day on, I shave every day without fail, even though he did too. Even my old man always shaved. He even drew on his moustache. <laughs> I often got a, a sore face out of it, but I considered that was better than doing extra, extra fatigues in the stables. <laughs> fatigues, extra fatigues. Love it. Uh, page 12. One day about two months into our training, there we go, we're two months in, there appeared on the, on the, on the, battery notice board outside the battery office and order to the to the da date to the effect that the Royal Artillery was to become mechanised and men with the rank of driver would now become gunners and the rank of horse driver would be finished or words to that effect and gave the date when changeover would take effect, 1935 was the very early days of mechanisation of the whole of the British Army. Become a gunner didn't cause me any heartaches as as I was never that keen on horses. <laughs> so we did have that in common and was not sorry to see the back of them. <laughs> there was one birds are much easier than horses. There was one section of the RA, the Royal Horse Artillery, who kept their horses but only for special occasions and still do it to this very day. This is a little bit of trivia thrown in. Wow. I wonder if they still do. I bet they do. I've got to find out. Footnote here, page 12. I've got to find out. I need a pen. I've got to make marks in this. Uh, well, back to the story. We drivers are rather gunners were given the option as far as the army was concerned of becoming a tank driver on the limpet tank but that was to be used to pull the guns or to become anti-aircraft gunners a branch of the RA that was being developed but still very much in its infancy we were taken to the parade ground we were then used to tie on the putties he says I hope you can understand all that because I cannot <laughs> so even he doesn't understand it. I've got some. I've got a. I've got a screenshot. Um, I shall insert it here if I remember. But I will remember. I will insert. I will insert a sort of screenshot here of a modern, uh, it was the weekend, uh, I was on, it was on this weekend, I was watching um, Goodwood Racing and then they had a reproduction of D-Day and there was a, a guy wearing a British uniform on a British motorcycle, probably looked exactly like my old man did when he's talking about this in 1936. Now the army issued spurs were another form of hard labour when it came to cleaning and polishing of said spurs. They were issued to us just as they came out of the mould from the factory, pitted and very rough and made of steel. So once again came the instructions to clean and polish these spurs until they were as smooth as a proverbial baby's bottom. The method of polishing and smoothing the spurs was carried out by the use of what was known as a burnisher. This was a square of leather with a small steel ring fastened to the corner and a larger one in the opposite corner. A small ring fitted over the little finger and the bigger one over the thumb on the same hand, of course. This square of leather was covered with chain mail made out of steel. What else? And the object of the exercise in the polishing of these spurs was to sit down for a couple of hours or so and rub the spurs vigorously. Oh, Jesus Christ. This... Yeah, somebody said to me, aren't you glad you, grand you don't have the life of your grandparents? Well, I'm glad I don't have the life of my old man. This work was carried out whenever I had any spare time. 
until all the holes in the rough spots were gone and the spurs were nice and smooth and of course nice and shiny. Many hours of burnishing going. Pitted steel, hand polished on a thumb, on a thumb, maybe a piece of leather between there and there. Oh crap, I've got a, I've got a, um, a Dremel over there, high speed Dremel, you know, I'd use that. They'd get, weren't invented, but, but, and they wouldn't have been allowed, I've no doubt. But even though I cursed the bloody army, spurs and everything else connected with this cotton picking outfit, I always did it un, under my breath, as it were. Once again, I knew that I was learning what the word discipline meant. Uh, my old man knew what discipline meant, I can tell you. And he only hit me once, but yeah, he knew what discipline was. You had to learn for yourself, man. You hadn't taught anything. Now I come to the to the reason they took me into the army to learn to ride a horse, uh, army style. The RA used horses to pull their 18-pound field guns, for pulling the coal wagons that do delivered the coal to the married quarters, and for pulling anything and everything that had to be pulled. The guns were pulled by a team of six horses, usually matching pairs, and with three drivers, one to each pair. The front driver was known as the lead driver, and he controlled the front, two front horses and was always an NCO, non-commissioned officer, if you know what that is. The driver in charge of the two middle horses was known as the centre driver, and the driver nearest to the gun was known as the wheel driver. The officer all had their own horses, and officers were all had their own horses and were all top-class horsemen, as did all the senior NCOs. Now, up to the time of my joining the army, the only experience I had ever had of riding any sort of horse was a donkey at New Brighton Beach as a kid, and I think I even fell off that. Yeah, well, we have that in common, Dad. I fell off a horse too when I was a kid. You know, I haven't ridden one since. Well, no, I'll tell them why I have once, only because of a woman. Our early training in horse riding was carried out in a on a wooden horse or rather a replica of one. This was used to show us the correct way to stand in front of a horse, with one hand on the tether side of the horse's mouth holding the bit as if for inspection. The drill for mounting was to stand on the near side of the horse, the right side of the beast looking to the front, reins drawn tight in the left hand, hand placed in front of the saddle, right hand on the rear of the saddle, left foot in the stirrup and up and over, hoping that one will land in the saddle type of saddle used in the army was known as an armchair type with the raised pommel in front right between your balls and back and there's one at the back to take your ass I found that all the work on the wooden horse including mounting like he didn't use balls and ass that's me I threw that video um, dismounting was very easy and when I eventually came to do it on a real life horse it was different kettle of fish as the saying goes <laughs> After about two weeks of training on the wooden horse, we were taken down to the stables and presented with the real thing. A real live horse for me to train on. For the rest of my time in the depot, I was given a big grey horse called Quicksilver, who was close on to 17 hands high. My God, that is a big horse. Big horse in any man's language. And in fact, I could nearly walk under the animal without ducking my head. My old, my old man told me about this horse, yeah, I remember this. Uh, gee, I was young, he never, yeah. He, he, talked, he talked about his, aunt, his uh, brother Jackie too, and, and, and he loved his brother Jackie. I, I've remembered since reading this. Uh, I remember at least once he talked about Jackie. He probably did it a few times until I was at a point where he was so drunk that he didn't care anymore. But that was most of the end of his life. So yeah, but he loved his brother Jackie, and he was he missed his he missed his brother Jackie. Yeah, Jackie died during the war early. Uh, so the horses that we had to train on. Now up to page ten. They had been in the depot for a number of years, and there would have been hundreds of recruits who had passed through the depot as drivers and trained on them because they certainly knew their way around. And I can tell you. <coughs> in the riding school during training and the riding instructor <coughs> gave instructions to any particular rider we always referred to him by his horse's name for instance if he wanted to do a quick right wheel the horse or, or break into a trot the order would be given quick silver right wheel or quick silver trot and as these horses had heard these instructions so many times in their life they would turn right or start to trot without me having to do anything at all 
I was supposed to turn to turn right when I was pulled pulled my right and I dug my heels in to the side and that is why I was convinced that they had been at the depot for a long time as they seemed to know all the words of command <laughs> horses are amazing my daughter has one now uh, my daughter has a horse that runs in the family the real fun in the riding school was when I had to learn to dismount whilst the horse was trotting around the, the school oh god I had to hold onto the front of the saddle with both hands, stirrups crossed over the front of the saddle, and in, in a real cowboy style, throw my leg out behind and come down beside the horse. Run three paces, throw my legs forward, dig my heels into the ground, then swinging my legs backwards and upwards, vault back into the saddle. It looked easier when the cowboys did it in the films. And of course, in the early days of training, I and all the others <coughs> never dis... dis mounted in the saddle but landed on the horse's rump and if you missed the saddle you just hung onto the front of your saddle dropped to the ground again and kept trying and running to the side of the GG but after trying this stunt three or four times and getting worse at each attempt I had to stop as I was bugging running around a riding school by the side of a trotting horse without trying to vault on and off would have been bad enough but trying to get back into the saddle made that much harder and more tiring to hear the master of the understatement, my old man, obviously. Are you kidding me? Oh, my God, I would never have been able to have done that at any stage in my life. I've never been that fit. But after a while, I got the hang of it and found it great fun until the riding instructor told me to try to vault on and off the other side of the <laughs> It was like trying to write with your left hand. Well, I'm right-handed, but there again, I eventually mastered that also. I can see how that is. Whippet tank. Whippet tank. Ah. The tank moved forward. Ah, but whippet tanks. It was manoeuvred by two levers that controlled the two tracks that the tank moved forward on. If the driver wanted to turn, and he simply, if he wanted to turn to the right, he simply uh, slowed the right hand track and increased the speed of the left. And vice versa, if he wanted to go the other way, and I never know my old man drove a tank, and if I did, he only ever mentioned it once when I was very young. <coughs> as far as the actual driving of the tank, tank, I never did find out how it worked. Oh, he didn't, because, I, because when I saw how the driver was fully exposed to the weather, and also to the enemy, yeah, the power, the power in the time of battle and being a, a man without fear and very brave, I decided there and then, that this tank driving like was not for me. <laughs> Sarcasm, one of my father's strong points. I decided to give this anti-aircraft capper a go. The rest of the time spent in the depot was spent mainly on mar uh, marching, rifle drills, PDS, PTs, fatigue, P PTs, oh yeah, fatigues, and of course plenty of spit and polish. Spending time in a small canteen and learn to knock out a pretty good tune on the old piano. There were four guard rooms in the depot known as North, South, East and West. And across the road from, I think, the East Gate was the service canteen where we were allowed to go in for fatigue dress in the evenings for a few hours for a change from, um, from the canteen of the barracks and where I used to play pool, have a cuppa and chat to some of the other trainees. We were now getting close to the day when we would be the number one squad up front on the parade ground. So he's, he's reaching, he's reaching uh, time when he, when he graduates. Uh, sorry, I've missed it, dropped it. We would soon be getting ready to take part in passing out parade. Things have become a lot easier at this time in our training, especially with the, the removal of the horses. We were allowed out into town occasionally, mainly spent uh, nights going to the pictures. Well, well, that's something going to the pictures. I've lost the left-hand side of the page here. My fault. I, I copied it. My fault. I remember how we had all changed. We were 32 different men from those who had been thrown together three months ago. Sounds like they all made it. Well, well done. 32, well, 
we were a lot, heck of a lot fitter and we had all become good friends. When it was our turn out on parade, and excellent in our rifle marching and drill. By this time we had become fond of our instructors, sort of, anyway. And then they had become quite human as we became better soldiers. Yeah, they became more equal. We men became, had become very tolerant of each other and, and each other's problems. And, and we had sorted out problems that had become between, come up between ourselves. This, I guess, is my first introduction to comradeship. Wow, he talks about the emotion, the emotion that must have been... you got to remember that half of these men would have died. And it was something that... Ugh, this is tough. I carried right through my service and that into my civilian's life. Something I carried right through my yeah, life. So October came round and the big day was really getting close. And we were all excited. As we knew that... When we did pass out, we would all be hoping, going home on leave, the day before we were due to pass out, found us all sitting, spitting final polish to our boots, leather belt, chin strap, uh, when somebody's shooting at you. There are other riding tricks that would have done credit to any circus act. like fling over jumps in the school blindfolded and not knowing where the jumps were placed in the school. My sister typed this, hey, my sister typed this. She's a, she was a typist in the public service. 120 words a minute. There you go. She can't spell school. S-H-C-O-O-L. Every time. Oh, well. Or if, and she can, but I know what that is. That's fingers not working properly. Or even how high they were set at and to, and to the, the misery. I was not allowed to use my stirrups. So I crossed over the saddle and to the top of to top it all off, I had to have my arms folded. The duty of this exercise was that if a horse decided it did not wish to take the jump, there was no way in my early training that I was going to stay in the saddle and as stated, I had no idea where the jump was and I often took the jump but the horse didn't. There was always that and yeah, that's what happened to me. I took the jump from the horse, didn't I? Hit my head, and that's why I didn't get back on. Yeah, my old man was a tough old asshole. There was always plenty of abuse from the riding instructor, and here again after a while, I could tell when the horse was not going to make the jump, and I always managed to stay in the saddle. There you go. The first job every morning, and I mean every morning, seven days a week, was cleaning out the stables, grooming the horses, and then feeding them. Um, watering them. The watering troughs were in the centre of the parade ground and one driver would take four or five horses at the same time to drink. The cleaning of the stables was known as mucking out. Yep, still going. And this was one of the least pleasant jobs I had to do, hence the punishment for the misdemeanor was always extra, uh, extra times in the stables. The work consistently consisted of cleaning the straw that had been put down for the horses to sleep on the night before and was stinking with a strong smell of urine from the horse and was so strong that it used to make my eyes water. And of course not forgetting the horse's droppings that had to be shoveled up and taken to a tipping place. Oh, good for worm juice. Plants, oh, I like worms. Worms are fun. Then the whole place had to be hosed down and all this was carried out before breakfast. And if it was not done before, <laughs> you know, facing breakfast after that, to the satisfaction of the sergeant, we did the cleaning part all over again. And this happened many times early on. The horses of the army were number one priority as they cost money and an important item as far as the army were concerned. On the other hand, horses were never plentiful and could always be found or kicked out. Were, were always found or kicked out if they were no good. As far as the army was concerned, horses first, drivers second, page 11. Now, now I come into, now I come, when, what? We might take a break there, I think. Uh, that's Gandalf squawking at me. So, uh, page 11, just at the top. We'll get back to this. Uh,
This is interesting. My old man was pretty handy as a horseman. All right, you can come round there. Sorry about that, people. I ran out of memory on that card. Okay. The, yeah, the big day was getting really close. We were all excited as we knew that we, as we did pass out, we would all be going home on leave. Freshly blank and everything. Well, this is hard for me, guys. Passing out parade was brought up to as close to perfection as possible. We all realised that tomorrow would be our last day of training and when we did finish our passing out, we would all become regular soldiers in the Royal Regiment of Artillery and as said, the big thrill was that we would be going home on leave for 14 days and we all talked about what we were going to this page this page 13 is it yeah to do when we page 13 no. and we did get home our sergeant and bombardier came around through the day looking at our equipment and giving us advice about the following day and told us to just remember that we had learned what we'd learned over the last three months and would all be okay so dad was still 16. he then gave us our instructions for the next day and told us that he would be marching us up to the main parade ground and he would be in charge of us during the whole parade. I guess there would be many of many an old artillery man who remembers that parade ground. And many that wouldn't. And many of they're all they'd all be dead now. Yeah. They'd all be dead. This is a uh, this is a long time ago. We decided to club together and buy the two instructors a farewell gift, but unfortunately as much as I have racked my brains, I don't remember what the heck it was. <laughs> but I do remember putting in my two bob towards the gift. The sergeant came around just before lights out and told us to have a good night's sleep and not to worry about the parade the next day as we were amongst the best squad he had ever trained. I believe that too. I guess he told that to all the squads he had trained in the depot. And I believe that too. And to get out there tomorrow and swing those arms and stick out our chests. And I mean the sergeant would have actually believed that they were the best that he'd ever trained. Why not? He probably did better every time he did it. We all learn. We all learn more than we realise. It took quite a long time for us all, sorry I'll get back to this now, it took quite a long time for us to all settle down for the night as we were all talking about getting out of the depot and being posted to a regular unit. But eventually sleep got the better of us. Reveille the next morning was at 3 a.m. No, 6 .30. It's 6.30. At 6.30 a.m. and we had to fall in outside our barrack room by 9.30, ready to march to the parade ground. So after breakfast we gave our uniforms a final polish and got ourselves drafted, dressed in our full uniform, riding breeches, jacket, cap and spurs, and our highly polished boots that had cost us so much time in the cleaning of them. But looking at mine I reckon it was all worth all the trouble and I felt really proud to think that I had at the age of 16 years, been able to get through three months of very hard work and often despairing times. And a lot of people drop out of basic training in the army, believe me. A lot of people drop out at 16 years old. That's a tough old asshole. And even tears. But here I was, a very different person to when I joined up. A lot more independent and proud of the achievement that I had obtained. Then came the parade itself. We marched, countermarched, and our rifle drill, all this accomplished by the Royal Artillery Band. There was a lot of top army officers around watching, and we put on a top class display and we passed the saluting base where the officer commanding the depot was taking the salute. And our eyes right and was carried out as one. Then back to our bag room, what a relief. We all felt like we were all congratulating each other and generally acting like school children. All the hard work, the last three months finished and all behind me. Our sergeant instructor came and told us that we had been terrific and that he would be going home on leave the next day. Pay and railway warrant would be issued, we would, we would be going home, and it issued at 9.30am the next day. And then said their goodbyes and he then handed us our collar dogs in the shape of an exploding bomb also made of brass that fitted it, I've never seen that, that fitted into the collar of our tunic, the final song. My old, 
my old man sold his medals, apparently, in the 80s at the, to somebody at the Scottish Club. I'd love to track them down. I was always told that I, I lost them, and that's why they disappeared, but apparently not. Maybe I lost the first lot and he sold the second lot. I don't know. Medals, badges, final assignments, army crap. The final sign that we were now regular soldiers and ready to take our place in the army. I can remember just as we reached our barrack room after the parade, a new squad of recruits in their brand new fatigues, in dress, marching past, and how sorry I felt for them. They had it all in front of them. That evening, we all went into town feeling very cocky and swaggering about town as though we owned it. But I felt that it, we did, I felt that it did not cut any ice with the local population as they had seen many new soldiers on their first night in town before. Of course they had. And they were poms, so it was very, you know, <laughs> very British, very upper, upper lip, you know, very stiff upper lip on the sun. Next morning we were all up bright and early, and now I have time to try and read it, all our trouble reading. And, mm -mm, and early before the first time, and in my new army life, I was able to wander around to the dining room for breakfast without having to be marched around. After breakfast, we all paraded in the, at the battery office and were issued with our railway warrants and our pay, including the extra that had been taken out during my training period. My warrant was made out from Woolwich Station to Live Street Station, Liverpool, and with my kit bag packed with all my worldly possessions, including my dress uniform, which I had to buy, and consisted of a dark blue jacket buttoned up, I bet it would have been gorgeous, to the, to the neck, and with brass buttons and slacks with bright red stripes down the outside of the trouser leg. I remember that. And a hat with the same colour and a red band, red hat band cap. Amazing tradition, these people. Amazing tradition. Uh, I don't get it. Well, I do, sort of. I mean, when you rely on your mate next to you for your life, I suppose it is what it is. The same as the issue. Sorry, oh, sorry, ran out of memory once again. Third card for one reading. Okay. We're nearly over, up to page 14. I think I'll leave it off where, where he, when he gets home, when he gets back home. We'll see. And did not need any policy of, of interest. The motto on the cat badge was in Latin. On the top scroll was the word ubiquae, meaning everywhere, and the bottom scroll was the words quo fas a gloria, meaning where might and glory live. So they were everywhere where might and glory live. Not only was the cat badge a bought one, but also the spurs were bought. And when home on leave, I did not wear the issue type spurs, as the bought ones were stainless steel and they did not need cleaning <laughs> either. And also they had a small wheel at the end of the spurs that used to jingle as I walked along. So he had his own dress spurs, eh, with a jingly spur, good on him. <laughs> I would have done the same thing. Well, eventually I found myself at Houston Railway Station and getting on the train for Liverpool. At last I was on my way home after... I mean, I would have put, probably would have had bullets on the straps as well, you know. That would have been cool. Police bullets. Half bullets. Yeah. Skulls of... Yeah, no. Nah, that's what I did later. I did I did that halfway through my life. Uh, back to this. Uh, uh, I was on my way home after what had seemed to be an eternity. I do not recall much of my journey to Liverpool, but I can well remember when I got out of the train at Lime Street Station looking around and remembering back just three months when I had left from here to go to Woolwich Depot, a 16-year-old boy whose big thing in life had been working as an errand boy. And here I was back again as a soldier and feeling very proud of myself. Standing on the station, knowing that I had... I was dressed in one of the smartest uniforms in the British Army. Yes, it was. And out of those days. So here I was, the first hurdle of my army life behind me. But I was to have many more hurdles to get over before I reached my demob day and became a civilian again. My time at the depot had turned me from a 16-year-old boy who knew nothing about anything in life or the great big world outside into a 16-year-old man so still a 16 year old, with a lot more knowledge of most things. The three months spent at Woolwich set the pattern for my life and until this present day. Yeah, I think I'll leave that there. 
up to page 14, he gets home to his mum. Mm. It's tough. Uh, my old man was tough. I see how this set the rest of his life pattern. He, he didn't treat me like I, would, I was in the army, but it was close at times. Yeah. How do I feel about that? I don't know. I wish he'd been more open to me. That would have been nice. Um, now he teaches you to stay to yourself, keep to yourself. This only goes to the end of the war. I wish I knew more about him after the war. I mean, I went to nine schools. Nine schools. <laughs> he probably went to a half a school, really. And then the army. So, yeah, I don't know. So, page 14. I suppose this is really chapter two. This is officially, I would make this chapter two in the book, uh, and the first chapter being three months in the army, the basic army, now he's in the Royal Army Artillery which is different, the Royal Army Artillery did have the, one of the smartest uniforms, it did have one of the biggest egos if you want to put it that way, in the Royal Army and that's saying something, because the Royal Army is full of tradition and full of bullshit. Uh, my old man was full of it, there's no doubt of that. Uh, but yeah, I suppose that three months that he, that I've just read out saved his life uh, from 1941 to 1945 in a prisoner of war camp in Japan in the end. Without that three months training, turning him into an asshole basically. In the end, I mean, I'm an asshole. He's an ass. He was definitely an asshole, from what he says, what he admits in here. Discipline, discipline, discipline. Mm. But yeah, probably saved his life. So for all my bluster and my bullshit about how I hate the army, and what I do, I hate the army severely. That's why I've never read this, I suppose. Um, Without it, I wouldn't be here. Uh, that's hard for me to say, in a way, but not really. Um, without his service in in the army, beginning now, as he goes home to his mum, I'm not sure where he goes next. I I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's Hong Kong. I don't. I'm not. I'm not going to guess at this stage. It's 1935. I don't think you know, it could be Hong Kong. I don't think it is though. I think he might go to India. He goes to India. Gurkhas. I know he plays around with the Gurkhas. And they have their own little clique, the Gurkhas. He was a part of them. They loved him. I'm speculating. I don't know. It's been hard for me. It's caused me tears. It's three months. I'd love to know how many of the men that he graduated with in his class that he called brothers, basically. Because the, the emotion in here is... <laughs> A lot of uh, one paragraph of emotion from my from my old man that I, I never saw in his whole life, uh, except for Jackie. But he doesn't. I mean, he mentions Jackie, and he doesn't. But he doesn't talk about Jackie. But the men that he he called brothers and the men he graduated with, the, his friends, I wonder how many were alive at the end of 1945. They'd all be dead now. But you know, I wonder how many had families. And, children. Not enough. Mm. Not enough. I'll get back to you <laughs> on that note. Yeah.